um, print your report and um, staple everything together in one uh, one thing and make sure the first page has your name and um, um, and then put it outside of my door that's uh, engineering 271 so second floor go as far east as you can um, And uh, I want to say a few things I've heard. Well, first of all, I'm hoping this is going to be the future here of the tablets, but because <laughs> I'm having too many problems with the one I uh, were running. But um, so oh, that's enough advertisement. Come on, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> any questions about um, publishing this? Has everybody uh, was able to at least run these commands in a file and then um, well, as I said, just you didn't have to do anything but just copy and paste the M file, which is a format, right? Um, hmm? No, everybody's passed that, that step. That's good. Um, let me. Yeah, I can type. This is incredible. Okay, so one thing that came up, um, we talked about last time about sensitivity to um, to a certain parameter. In this case, was okay. So I, I just ran the whole file, but I didn't really mean to. Um, one one word of caution is if you have the cell mode here, which is by default enabled. So you can run each cell one at a time. Um, don't just go in a randomly, like in the cell that you want to evaluate and start there, um, because the previous cells may contain, you know, the information needed for this cell. So, so you're, if you're not sure what what you need to run uh, to start running, for instance, if I want to just uh, focus on this sensitivity, then I have to go, you know, a little bit up. Can I can I start here? I don't have the X defined, so the X is defined previously, right? So the way I wrote this code is that it needs to run like you need to start, you know, from the beginning. If if it didn't have to, if if it didn't need anything from above, like then you can, um, and if you start fresh, so for instance, you clear all everything. So right now, my log has, knows nothing about what I've done before, right? You just open it. Then um, if I run here. And I run this cell, you see it already tells me. So, not a reason to get frustrated. It just means you have to go, you know, where it was defined. Okay, so here's where it was defined, and you run it. And, um, you know, it's not the most efficient way, of course, but uh, one thing that I want to point out is this. When you start doing sensitivity, so you have a parameter that you want to change its value and uh, analyze the dependence on that value. The function that needs to be optimized, in this case maximized, obviously depends on on that parameter, right, as well as x. The nature of the of the function x is uh, the, the function as a function of x is pretty much the same. It's a parabola pointing down, right? But the location of the maximum, the vertex changes is a depend you know becomes a function of r and that's the sensitivity that you're computing so so what you do here is you solve um, you find that x coordinate of the of the vertex of that parabola that moves with r okay so in one of the homework problems it asks, it asks not only for the 
x coordinate of the vertex, but also for the y coordinate of the vertex. So if you need to do, if you need to do sensitivity of the y coordinate of the vertex in terms of r, then what do you have to do? Besides computing the the x max, y max r, y max r, and that's done by, I just give this name is uh, substituting in y the variable x with what value? With this value, x max, x max r, which was computed for the previous, right? So if I'm now running, remember, now I, now I have everything, I run everything once, so x is in there, so I can just run this cell then you can see the x max r right as a function of r as well as the the maximum whatever it was profit right as a function of r right so this subs, subs, uh, subs at, uh, can be done not only for substituting numerical values into the variable is is done here for instance but you can also substitute symbolic variables, right? X max r is still a symbolic function of r into that, okay? And then you do sensitivity to that. By the way, uh, you don't have to do this, this piece, right? Remember what I said? That was just kind of an extra thing to see a table of values, right? But when you when you focus on a problem like let's say first or fourth problem or something in a homework don't you don't you don't um, just copy the whole code and you start modifying it right I would say just look at the whatever the, the whatever the parts of the code are relevant for that problem right or ideally just close your eyes and 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 do it you know that's appropriate for that problem right do a piece of code that's appropriate for that problem okay in other words change the name of the variables if you need to right i mean if it's if if the parameter is not r but is a right then don't use x max r right invent a different name right just something that so you have to kind of be able to keep track of of what the code does at each line Okay, so for instance, this piece just unless unless uh, you you want to see that kind of um, table, right, of values, then you may not need that that piece of, of code. And then just here, you would do sensitivity to. By the way, you can copy pieces of code and and run them in the command window if if for whatever whatever reason that's more convenient. Um, right, or you might be able now to uh, to start changing. Like you can do y and get the sensitivity with respect to the uh, of the um, of the maximum profit with respect to that parameter, right? Now what I what I just did is I actually worked in the command window, which it's fine to do it once just to kind of uh, clarify you know in your in your mind how to do the sensitivity with respect to this uh, I mean of this um, value of this variable with respect to R but but in the end it has to get into the the file right so the commands have to get in the file so you can publish them. Right? Otherwise, nobody will know that you've done it or what you've gotten, right? Worst case scenario is, is if you're still having trouble, is do whatever you do and just write by hand. But, you know, it's just. I think eventually that, that won't really work. Okay? Okay. So, what's, what's this sensitivity mean, for instance? What's this number mean? for that pig problem. 
this is a ratio between relative changes, right? Between the quantity that you observe, right? I said the conclusion, whatever, of that model is uh, to that parameter. So this just says what? That the ratio is, is negative. It means a, a relative increase in the parameter makes a relative decrease in the in the maximum profit, right? Also, it says what? It says that kind, of, kind of what that uh, relative change. 10% relative change in R causes what? 1%, 1.4, 1 1.5% change in the maximum profit. Why is it 1.4? 1, 1 why not 14? With the decimal, right? Isn't it 14% or is it? Yeah, but if I pick 10%, so you have to imagine a fraction that has 10 in the bottom. What has to be in the top to make 0.14? I think it's 1 point something, right? Uh, oh. See what I mean? If, but, but again, uh, there was a question, is like, why do we always pick 10%? It's just kind of uh, easy that comes to, to mind. I mean, of course, it's not, as I said last time, this is not accurate for large. Even 10% could be very large. Uh, variation in the parameter, right? Maybe we should say 1%. But then if you say 1%, this would be 0.1%. And it becomes really hard to say, is it sensitive or not sensitive, you see? When you, at least when you say 10% change, it becomes 1% change, that's not so sensitive, sensitive, right, after all. So, so this maximum profit is not that sensitive to whatever R was. Right? But it's more sensitive for the expert. The number of days is sensitive, but if you're you know, if you're really interested in the you're in the end you're really interested in the profit, right? Then it's it's it, the the actual profit maximum profit is not so sensitive to that to that parameter. Um, let's see, two things about the problems in the homework. Let's see, how many of you have tried, you know, tried some of them? Okay, so any questions? I mean, step one is usually the hardest, right? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, so. So, right, so, now, I'll, 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 uh, we'll talk uh, precisely about that example, but let me just say this, that um, each problem has a, will have a certain peculiarity. So there's going to be something that you probably like, kind of, you don't feel comfortable because you haven't seen it before. And in this problem, you have that situation where it says the number of sales increased by a certain, at a certain rate, depending on the number of rebates, right? Um, so the, unless you are, um, you've worked in the car dealership a lot, um, it will be a little bit uncomfortable, I guess, to translate that. So um, let me just, well, let me say that there is not one ex correct approach and then the others are wrong, OK? Um, So there may be several of them, uh, but the one that I, you know, I kind of think about uh, is the following: is if you have certain, so a certain number of sales lead to this profit, right, per sale in profit, right? Okay, and we don't know what, it's not given to us what that number of sales is. It just says these are the sales that uh, when they're, you know, when they're done, when they're closed, uh, we get this much profit. And the information that's given to us is that for each rebate of $100, That causes what kind of rebate? Uh, what kind of sale? The sales increase by 15%. So how do you write that? 
Well, it's whatever this number is, let's call it n naught. It's going to be n naught plus n naught times 0.15, right? So it's n naught times 1 plus 0.15, okay? So this is $100 rebate. Now again, this is, this is, I don't know, this is the by market uh, analysis or something, right? It's usually kind of an assumption. And a further assumption is that if you double that rebate, you're going to another 15% on top of the first 15%. Now, that's that's debatable, right? That's that's already the it's it's kind of something that um, so so a thirteen hundred dollar profit. I mean, you will actually you know, you're getting fifteen hundred profit, but if you're given uh, two hundred dollar rebates, that's going to create another fifteen percent. So this is n naught times. 1 plus 1.5 times 2, right? And so forth. So, right? So I'll let you conclude what uh, the formula should be, but clearly the variable is the number of rebates or the amount of the rebate. You, your pick. You see, the, um, many times you will only realize that you've, you've, you've translated it wrong or, or not as it's really meant to be in reality or how it's actually meant to be in the, in the situation that you described, only when you are at the end of, the, of, the, of your model and you're drawing conclusions. Right? And so you, you may actually come up with you know, some, some sort of different equation and then you end up at the end with some conclusion that it's just not right. Okay. For instance that uh, but even that you may not be very clear that it's not right, right? So that's kind of I mean you may end up with a conclusion saying which is not this case but that uh, it's better not to give any rebates. In fact, it's better to increase the price or something, uh, like, like charge people for um, whatever, just to increase your profit, right? Which is not very uncommon, I guess. Um, okay, but yeah. So what you have written up there is you have a certain number of sales, but how I read it in the book, says makes a profit of $1,500 on the sale of a certain model. So I almost want to take, you know, and not to be one. So I want to be a call and I will make $1,500. Right. Is that a safe assumption to make? Exactly. So, so when you get to profit, now the profit is going to be a uh, number of sales, right, which is N times uh, whatever, the amount of rebate, right? So it's going to be whatever. You see, it's always going to be n not times what it is per per sale, right? The so increase per sale. So it's going to be this quantity multiplied here, and then of course the amount of rebate with whatever that is, right? Now. Again, I didn't. I didn't say what. So you have to decide. Do you want the number of rebates to be the variable, or you want the amount of rebate to be the variable? Doesn't matter, right? But that's going to play in here, and then your function to be maximized or minimized is going to be a constant multiple of a function that doesn't depend on this. So for for maximization purposes, it's safe to just drop that, right? And then think about profit per sale. Okay. So it's, yeah, that's.
Exactly. So, in problem number seven, uh, the only difference from uh, the standard, you know, the big problem is, is that uh, is the profit per day. So, you know, it's a ratio between the profit you would make total, right? When you sell divided by the number of days you kept, right? And um, so it's, it's just a different function, okay? And in fact, the number of days was, was the variable, right? X. In the previous one, right? So this, this should have been, uh, the number of days is X plus the 90 days that you kept. Uh, so that, that's where that piece of information enters. And of course, also the numerator is going to change slightly because there was some fixed cost that's has occurred in the first 100 days or 90 days. Yeah, so this really should just, uh, the code should be, be sort of, it's already there, you just need to modify the function in that code, right? That's all. Um, okay. All right, so any other questions? All right, so um, let me kind of start chapter number two. So in this chapter, we're going to move from one variable optimization to two or, or uh, multivariable optimization. And um, when you have multivariable optimization, you probably know that there is there are issues of where the function is defined. You know, if it's defined on some uh, bounded region. So this is really Calc three stuff. So let's 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 imagine a two D uh, scenario where I have a function. Of two independent variables, so f function of two variables x1, x2. Then the best way to represent this is through it's it's a surface, right? And or let's call it z, something like that. So then the graph is going to be some sort of a surface, right? Assuming f is nice and smooth. And um, to find the maximum or the minimum, you would have to do what? So first look, first look inside of your domain, right? For critical points. Critical points are points where the gradient is zero. So the partial derivatives are zero, right? The tangent planes are horizontal. So inside, so x1, x2 belong to some region R. Let's say this is the region R, right? So inside R, we're going to compute the gradient. Or solving the gradient equal to zero uh, yields the critical points. All right, so what does this amount to? This basically means partial derivative of f with respect to each variable is zero. So that's a system, right? That you need to solve, and that may actually not be easy. So that's another reason why you need a. It's some, uh, most of the times you need a computer, but. Um, this is not the end. Once you find the critical points, you need to do what? Have 
How do you do that? So, um, the second derivative test So let's let's say that uh, we get a, a solution that's. I'm going to put this hat. I don't know if you've seen it. I mean, if you use hats or tilde's or whatever, but this is going to be a critical point. Second derivative test for um, local max minimum uh, is uh, the second. So it's. So let's look at the Hessian, right? So the second derivative of f with respect to x1, second mixed derivative x1, x2, second mixed derivative x2, x1, and second first derivative with respect to x2. Okay, and um, again, Calc 3 tells you um, that x hat is is local mean f anybody on second uh, row or higher f um, let's see so first of all the not only that the determinant has to be positive but also that the uh, first the, the derivative here has to be positive. That's a minimum, right? What's the best way to remember this? Think of the paraboloid, right? x1 squared plus x2 squared. That has a minimum, right? What's the Hessian uh, determinant? So it's 2, 0, 0, 2, right? So it's a positive. So that gives local minimum. How do you have a local maximum? Right, so if the determinant is still positive, but the entry on the, on the first corner here is negative, right? And uh, x is a saddle if the determinant is negative. Okay? Alright, so. And of course, you can write this f x1 x1 f x2 x2 minus f x1 x2 f x2 x1 but these these two are the same so you could just square the mixed partial derivative right of course if f is continuous then it has all nice derivatives so all right so so then you decide and you found basically the local maxima local minima and then you also have to look at the boundary right of the of the region, and decide if there is anything that's higher. So it can actually get messy, right? Because on the boundary, if the if the region is like a rectangular region, you have four pieces of the boundary. You have to do parameterization. You have right. It's actually quite. Uh, it can you know it's just just uh, a lot of kind of mechanical work. But the idea is clear, right? You're looking for the highest point on that surface. You have several local minima, local maxima. You look for the highest among the local maxima, and the, the points on the boundary. Okay, so we'll we'll start with kind of simple examples. But that's that's um, goes into uh, the stuff that we didn't, you know, you didn't count three. Okay, so how about a specific? Situation. So the example is, you know, no longer farm uh, situation, but it's uh, manufacturing. So color TV problem, and um, 
I have the code here and I have the published version so let me just copy it in, uh, in MATLAB but By the way, I don't know if you've uh, noticed there, there are some little colored uh, things here that you can, well, first of all, this thing is not green. Green would mean everything's fine, the code is perfect, right? Well, at least MATLAB recognizes it. But if it's not green, if it's yellow, it means there are some errors, not terrible errors, so you can still run the code. Um, in other words, you can make an error like a misspell then uh, this should turn red. Well, maybe that wasn't bad enough, but I think if you do some sort of, um, I don't know, like this is red, right? So if, if you have something terribly wrong in the, in the code, you're going to get an error. If the code is going to uh, give an error, it's gonna, you're going to see this red. Um, that's a very important thing when you publish So I saved it, but now it's going to publish, and what's, what do you think is going to happen? You don't see any output. So that's, that's actually important. If you turn in your homework and, it, uh, and, and, and there's nothing like a no output, no pictures, no output, means what? The code has an error, right? So don't 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 send uh, something that has an error. Yeah. Um, I know we should have published it, but it came up over there on the right. Do I need to worry about that for the homework? Yeah, just there's a publish, here. Here. there's a publish button here. There's a publish button that um, again once the code is in is in this um, format, uh, it will distinguish the cell, so you can kind of browse like an HTML file. This one here. Okay, so so that's. Okay, yeah. So this is 2009A. Then you go to file, and it says publish. interesting okay has anybody run into this problem before let's go to file yeah I went to file but I don't see publish I think you have to be in uh, in editor mode where is editor I think I have here's editor oh yeah it is in a publish okay so in an editor it's you look in the editor okay um, all right. Does it make sense with this color coding, which is kind of useful? Uh, and and again, if it's not, so this was an error, right? This is not what MATLAB uh, uses for defining things. It's just equal. But uh, even if it's yellow, there might be uh, hints, or you know, to for instance, if you don't terminate with a semicolon, right? I don't know why they care, but it just, they just kind of they tell you that you know you might have not wanted that um, because it might look ugly, you know. So anyway, um, all right. So here's a problem. In a few words, I don't want to spend uh, too much time on the um, on the actual description, but. In summary, you have you have a manufacturing plan that that um, uh, is doing two types of TVs, and um, I think now it's old-fashioned. 19 and 21 inches is is almost unheard of, but um, okay, 55 and 75 inch TVs. <laughs> um, so two types of TVs, and each has a certain price. 
uh, selling price, and each has a certain cost of manufacturing, right? And not only that, but there is some sort of uh, cannibalism between the two types. So if one, um, let's see, what's that? There are some rates at which the selling price of one type drops if, if there are too many of the others on the market, right? So if they're, they're, if they're not on the market, but being sold. If, if, uh, the, if the 19-inch, I'll say with the 1921, if the 19-inch set is being sold in a certain amount, that forces the price of the 21-inch to drop. Okay? And that rate of drop is assumed to be linear again. So for each, so what's the actual uh, wording? Just to, because interpreting this, this wording is important. So what do you say? It is estimated that for each type of set, the average selling price drops by one cent for each additional unit sold. So throughout this book, when we say for each additional thing, we, we mean what? We mean that if it's <coughs> one, it's going to drop by that amount, right? If it's two, it's going to drop by twice that amount. So it's a linear dependence. Now, that's just a model. You could, you could in reality, it's probably not, nothing's linear in the world, but um, that's sort of the first simplified model, okay? So, so how does that translate? Oh, and not only that, but furthermore, the sales of 19, that's what I was saying before, sales of 19-inch sets will affect sales of 21-inch sets. Again, through some rate of drop, or price drop. Okay, so, uh, so if I call S to be the number of 19-inch sets uh, built and sold, and I call T to be the number of 21-inch sets built and sold, and we call P. So again, we're, we're still in step one, right? So maybe I should still... Step one is to just <coughs> digest this, this situation, this problem. The selling price, P is the selling price for 19-inch sets, set, one set. And Q is the selling price, there's no number here, it's just selling price for a 21-inch set. Okay, and the main assumptions, well, I guess, what are the variables? To get a clue on the variables, you look at the question that's at the bottom, right, at the end, right? What is that question? How many units of each type of sets should be manufactured? Right? So the variable should be, well, probably S and T, right? <coughs> Again, you might need to revisit this as, as you develop the model because it might be more advantageous to work with other ones, right? Other variables. But for now, I think it should be clear that these two are pretty much independent of each other. No, not independent, but the decision that you have to make on how many of each Right? Uh, could could span a whole region in the ST plane. So you could you could say I'm going to build this many of uh, this many of 19, this many of, of 21, right? And then see what the profit comes up to be, and then tweak those val those numbers S and T to get hopefully uh, a better a better profit. Okay. So. So how about these two variables? I mean, this I don't even want to call them variables anymore, right? We, we Remember what we talked about? We said in step one, we decide on what are our variables, parameters, and constants, right? 
and the function to be maximized or, or minimized. Right? But the function should depend on those variables. So if we have this sort of uh, as our variables, then we'd like to, the first thing is, can we express these quantities in terms of the variables? So, and the assumption is, I mean, the, assum the, the, the text is clear, right? It says, I think the 19 inch initially has a fixed, has a, has a set uh, selling price of 339, which now buys you, what, a 32 inch or something? Um, but then this price drops every time there is an additional unit build, right? So, there is a question of timing here, between the time you buy, uh, you build it, and the time you sell it. Everything here is sim is assumed to be like instantaneous, right? It's like everything you buy is going to guarantee to be sold at this price. Which again, it's doubt doubtful, but um, and but nevertheless, it's kind of funny, right? Because I mean, we're we're we're, we're talking about situations that are to I mean, are, are really are not realistic, right? I mean, in reality, life is is much more complicated. Okay. The thing is, if you start worrying about every single detail that, that you know happens in reality, you'll never build any, any model. You'll never draw any conclusion, right? So uh, that's why I sort of it's just strip it down like to bare bones, um, almost you know shamefully. I mean, just just psh, we're going to ignore everything, you know, most everything. Uh, we're going to try to come up with one conclusion, and then we're going to revisit our assumptions. Okay, so what is the cost of manufacturing? There was some uh, fixed cost, 400000 and then each set, a 19-inch set is $195. One each... Uh, 21 inch set is 225, so it's 185S plus 225T, okay? All right, and the objective? Maximize profit. And profit is revenue minus cost. So what's the revenue? Well, the revenue is, again, Assuming everything that's built is sold at this price, there's going to be the number of units times P, right? So, so it's S times P plus T times Q minus the cost. Okay? End of step one. Step two is what kind of uh, optimization, what kind of method should we, should we uh, use, and that's um, multivariable, in this, in this case two-variable optimization. And I'll say it's unconstrained. Um, because we'll talk also about situations where you have to um, optimize, maximize, minimize a, f a multivariable function, having some constraints on the on the independent variables. So they're they're still I independent, but they have to satisfy certain constraints. All right. So so what's step three? Standardize everything. To again, you don't have to necessarily use x1, x2, but um, I don't know. Maybe maybe s, x1 is s, x2 is t, and uh, z is the profit, right? 
or let's call it Y. I don't know why I call it Z. Y is <coughs> f of x1, x2 is a profit. And what's the profit? Well, is S. So it's x1 times whatever this P was, right? Plus x2, I'm just looking here, right? T times Q. Whatever Q is, but in terms of x1, x2 minus the cost and it even becomes uh, painful to write it down, right? So maybe just do this 339 minus 101 x1 minus 0 0.003 x2 and so forth, right? What's the nice thing about having this computer handy is you can you don't even have to write on a piece of paper but just type it in here make sure it's right okay and notice that because we're still working with symbolic variables I have to define x1 x2 first um, and the very next thing that comes to mind is to plot it so we plot this notice that it's no longer called easy plot but it's called easy surf because it's going to give you a surface um, if you don't specify the initial the domain, it will pick it for you, and it might not be what you need. So I think it's negative two pi to two pi on on each variable, right? So first thing is you don't need negative x one x two, right? But also the other thing is um, you might not know ahead of time. So let me let me just say Sims X one X two. Oh no, he's doing again. I cannot type again. Wow. Okay. Um. You said it's two months before the tablets come out? Okay. Um, I'm going to do it slowly, so. All right. But now, Sims. Okay. Sims. Yeah, so not not just that if I put a comma, it's not, it doesn't like it, right? So I can define, but there's various ways to define symbolic variables, but this is one way, and now I've defined y, right? And now if I do easy plot, as I said, with no prior knowledge, well, no, nah, what am I saying? Easy serve, right? Right, so that's that's unfortunately that's not uh, the best because negative two pi to two pi. You saw that. So let's do zero to ten, zero to ten. Doesn't look much different. So what's the, what's the problem? Since we don't know how large you know the x one and x two should be. What do we have to do first? We better solve. We better find if there is anywhere a critical point, right? So, so again, the first time you develop this code, you don't. It doesn't just come out like that, right? You don't know ten thousand is what was going to capture the essential thing. But so the best thing is. Well, if you have symbolic capabilities, and we do, we can differentiate, take the derivatives, that's the gradient, right? Each partial derivative. And then we can solve it. We can solve this. So let's run this. 
So I've taken the derivative, but I didn't display it. If I have to display it, then, well, it's in there, right? But I didn't display it. Okay. So you see, I mean, the function was quadratic in x1 and x2. So the, the derivatives will be linear, right? Which makes it, OK, you're going to be able even to do it by hand. But even by hand, you have this equal to 0, and you have the other equal to 0. No reason to uh, to even attempt, because remember, next thing is going to, we're going to change some of those numbers. Right? So, uh, so notice how you solve a system. So you solve a system by actually putting, remember before we just said solve and one equation, right? And we don't say the equation, we just say it was f, right? Or fx or something. And that assumes equal to 0, right? So now, now we actually, if we, if we type this and then comma this, then it's going to be this equal to 0 and this equal to 0 simultaneously. Now if I only do this, guess what's going to show? It's going to give a, an answer, right? First of all, it's going to be in symbolic form. Symbolic meaning, just to convince yourself. Remember, you can you can see the workspace. That's a good good thing to watch. Keep an eye on, right? And you can play around with this until it's the setup you want. So, so. Did I show you this workspace before? Yes? yes. So you see uh, the, the latest one we computed were the, then they're still symbolic, right? So even though there are numbers, well, first of all, you don't know how big the ones of those numbers are. So, so that's an incentive to actually convert them to double, right? So that's the reason why I'm actually running this. By the way, I just learned if you do control enter on a cell it also evaluates that cell and moves to the next one but I'm not going to attempt it on this so I'm just going to keep going here okay so I've run it here and you see I, I didn't display but you can see it here right so it's it's 4.73 10 to the third so this is like 4,000 something and 7,000 something right so at this point you can if you want to display, that's why you go back and you, you choose a 10,000 by 10,000, because that's going to capture at least that critical point. OK. So. so now I can see it. And I can rotate it here. Right? So everybody can see the maximum. You can do a bird's eye view. By the way, this is done by view 2. It just sets it from the top. And you can do contour plots and other things, OK? One thing to keep in mind is that you don't, uh, you never really get a perfect uh, thing with symbolic. But easy surf C, no, let me see, easy contour. And I think I spell it right. I think Thank you. Zero to ten thousand. Zero to ten thousand. By the way, uh, if you put a comma here, you're going to get error. So it's it's a little bit sensitive to what. Okay. So that's one thing. Another thing is easy contour. F. There, there are various ways to do plotting, and we're going to use some. But, okay. Anyway, so 4,000 and 7,000 is the critical point, and you know what? What's missing in this code here? The second root test. Didn't bother to do that because the graph showed it's a maximum, but. Right? I mean, you know, you should never trust graphs. Um, so I think, I think subsequent codes have that, even that, uh, 
uh, second derivative, right? Should we go through that second derivative test? So, so all you have to do here is say f one one. Let's say is the de 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 derivative of was it y with respect to x one. And then with respect to x1 again, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to display it, right? So the second derivative with respect to x1, with x2 is f22, ah, f22, and f12 is, or f21 is this, right? So all, you, all then you have to do is you have to take the, construct this Hessian. Yeah, but I, it, since it's the same as F12, my matrix is going to be just F11, F12, F21, F22. So in MATLAB, if you would define a matrix, like a 2 by 2 matrix, you see the semicolon actually uh, starts a new row. And a space between just keeps keeps you in the same row. So actually, we can display this. Ah, thank you. But I can put F12 like, okay. And I get that matrix, and now I just compute the determinant, right? And it looks positive, right? So it's either a local max or local minimum, and what decides is the sign of the fxx, by the way, is the same as the sine of fy, y, y. Is it always going to be like that? Why, why do we always look on the fxx, sine of fxx and not, not fy, y? Because it has to be, like, is it a saddle Right, but take a look at this. fxx, fyy minus fxy squared, that's the determinant, right? If the determinant is positive, so just a note here. If the determinant is positive, it means that fxx or f11 F22 minus F12 squared is positive. So this is negative, so this F11, F22 cannot be negative. Right? This means F11 and F22 have to have the same signs. Because if, if this were negative, you'd have two negatives, it couldn't be positive. Right? So F11 and F22 have to have the same sign, if the determinant is positive. Okay, so that's why there's no ambiguity when you check that. All right, so that's all right. So now, now we're convinced it's a, it's a local max. Okay, uh, how do we know it's an absolute max? We'd have to check on the boundaries, right? We'd really have to check on the boundary. For, for you know you could have local a single local max right but if you have an um, if you have an unbounded region you would have some somewhere else a settle and then things picking up again right so somehow you have to see what happens as x x1 x2 go to infinity and um, how do we see that well take a look at the well the function f or y, whatever y is, right? Uh, you look at the coefficients of x1 squared, x2 squared, those are the leading coefficients, and they're all negative. So it means as x1, x2 goes to infinity, things go negative, eventually even go negative, right? So it means you cannot beat, you cannot go higher than that value, which was, well, 
we didn't compute it here. Here's the next, here's the computation of that value, but it's going to be a positive profit. And also you have to check the bond, uh, like when x1 is 0 or x2 is 0, right? So our domain is, is what? Is the first quadrant. And then at the end you can say, well, it's a maximum. But, um, You know how it goes. I mean, you can actually claim, oh, I've done that in my head, and I've checked it, and it's, it's okay, right? And I'll accept it, unless your conclusion is wrong, okay? So, um, right? So, I mean, and eventually, we will talk about problems where you don't even have an explicit solution. Right, so then you actually can have, can say nothing. You can say, well, there's good. it looks from the graph. Can you imagine that? I mean, in, in Calc one, if you say from the graph we have a maximum, uh, it's, it's by far right. Uh, you have to do second derivative tests, right? But here we won't have explicit solution, explicit functions very soon. So we can just say, well, on a, on this region, uh, we have a you know a maximum point or something just uh, with no proof. Okay, so finally, let me just run this a little bit more. Um, I I haven't even displayed y max, but we can see what y max is. It's convinced yourself is like five point five times ten to the fifth. So that's certainly positive and quite big. All right. Um, any questions so far on this? So it's not much different except I wanted to be able to work with the code to adjust it to two-dimensional and three-dimensional and so forth, right? Because you have to uh, be able to adjust it, you know, to deal with those kind of problems. Now, last, last thing is I want to talk a few minutes about sensitivity. Okay. So sensitivity right now, I think the example talks about sensitivity to, to one of those numbers, 0 0.01, which was, um, is called, I mean, in this case, price elasticity. So again, it's the rate of change of the price when certain things happen in the market. So in this case, the more you sell, the cheaper it should be, or the maybe it's the other way around, but right. It can be cheaper the more you sell, right, and still make more money, right. So the question is, um, how how should you you know how sensitive it is to this parameter, the the price el elasticity. So th uh, think about what, what goes in. Well, it's kind of easy because once you have that typed in on the, on the top, you just copy and paste. You don't type it again because you'll, you'll make errors and those will cost you a lot. So you just copy and paste and you replace that whatever value was with A. So let's follow this quickly here. So you differentiate with respect to uh, x1, x2 at this point and then you solve it. At this point, what you're going to get is a critical point, but it's no longer going to be a number, I mean two numbers, right? A point in that plane, but it will be symbolic, symbolic and it will be depending on A. So, yeah, so I actually display that here. Does it make sense? So again, the best way to imagine this, and I, I know this is kind of hard if you haven't seen it before, but is you have your objective function that has a maximum, right, for a fixed value of a. As you change that value of a, that preserves its shape, it preserves its property of having a single maximum, but it's just moving. It's mov the maximum point it moves, and the, the maximum value may move, right? And those are the hats, little hats that I put um, but here you cannot put hats, so I just said 
I just append an A next to it, but clearly depends on A. This depends on A. So now these are the two coordinates of that point. And uh, next thing here is is this cell, which is going to plot those. Now, you don't have to plot these things, right? Unless you're really interested in knowing how you know how that production is going to change with with that parameter. So with the, you see the center is 0 0.01 and the here it's 10% relative change, right? 20%, 30%, 40%, 50 percent change relative change, right? And you see how so if I'm looking at the second one because it's closer to my hand here, but um, this was, what was this? X2 was the number of 21 units. So you see if that value actually is not, not one cent, the price of this is not one cent drop, but maybe two cents drop, then it's optimal if you increase that. Uh, production and sale, sales of the 21 inch and decrease the, the 19 inch, right? Believe me, you wouldn't be able to actually guess this by just reading that problem. I mean, you have to be supernatural to, or really, I mean, live, eat, sleep, uh, breathe economics to figure this out. Um, all right? And you can do elastic, uh, excuse me. You can do sensitivity like the same way as we did, and you're going to get that the sensitivity of the x1 with respect to a is going to be negative, right? And sensitivity of x2 with respect to a is going to be positive. So the first one is negative, second one is positive. I called s both. It's not a good practice, but right. And what if I have to uh, now really d figure out the sensitivity of the Profit, then I'd have to add, which I didn't add in the code, but y max a, right, is subs in y, x1, x2. So this is kind of a new if you haven't seen it before. You can substitute both variables, x1 and x2, with whatever x1 max a, x2 max a. And let's display it here. So I'm going to run this. Of course, it's never good to to well to to code it in the final script in the final in in the in the file, especially if it's not at the bottom. Like if it's if you try to introduce something that things you know it may get uh, messed up. But here was the bottom side. Whoa. Okay. So this. Doesn't look pretty, right? You can, of course, you can easy plot. So I'm just going to do it at command line. Easy plot y max a just to see. But it's not a good thing to do because this allows negative values for a, right? And it allows values that are maybe not relevant. What was a? It was 0 0.01, right? So you, you just want. Point one or something like that. In any case, you see it's a it's a drop. So the higher the A, the smaller the optimal profit will be. Okay. Um, so that's um, what I wanted to show you. Last word is next time we'll talk about uh, constraint optimization. So I posted actually the code that goes with that, with constraints. Uh, I don't want you to look at this necessarily, but I want you to look at the handout on Lagrange multipliers. This is a Calc 3 thing. Um, we'll discuss it briefly on Monday, but um, I want you to look at this. It's really, it's handwritten, so it's, it's just kind of my short version of Lagrange multipliers. Or take any Calc 3 book that talks about Lagrange multipliers uh, and just remember what they are, okay? 
All right, any questions? Shoot me an email. Um, don't forget my uh, office 271. Thank you. Everybody signed this uh, piece of paper?